So let's look at some examples for question five, the sequencing of knowledge. And let's start off right away uh, with a favorite account of mine of uh, direct instruction and how they work with sequencing. I think it's quite telling in terms of how it works both with a, a solid sequence, but also how they work with um, clear inferences. So let's start off by telling the story that uh, Engelman does. Engelman's the guy who started off direct instruction. And here he's in one of his blogs, he's pretending to be Socrates. Uh, the great philosopher who used to stand in open areas and just debate with people and ask them uncomfortable questions. And Socrates, in this case, is going to be asking a guy by the name of Rosenthal some rather tough questions about reading programs. Now, you have to bear in mind that Engelman has produced one of the most successful scripted reading programs in America and currently spreading uh, across the world. And the second uh, spoiler alert over here is that Engelman hates anyone interfering with the actual script, the sequence that he's produced. He feels he's worked out the best sequence and woe betide anyone who actually tries to uh, go against that sequence. So here we have a situation. It's in the campus coffee shop. Uh, the characters are uh, Socrates on the one side and Dr. Baram Rosenthal, who's an education guru. Right now, you can see where this is going in terms of the title guru. He's certainly not going to be a guru by the end of this. And the topic is teaching beginning reading. So Rosenthal starts off with a, a, an account which people in reading know. Um, the most effective beginning reading programs have distinct characteristics. They present phonemic awareness exercises, they teach phonics, they have decodable texts, and the instruction explicitly focuses on vocabulary, comprehension, and fluency. Now that's a pretty good account of the various factors which result in, in good reading programs, and that's what research tells us. But Socrates is not going to uh, take that uh, as the end point of the story. So he says, So, if I wanted to design an effective reading program for young children, would the program I create be effective if it had all these components? Now, uh, it's going to be a trick question, as it, it turns out. But Rosenthal is none the wise, and he says, Well, yes, of course. These are the guidelines we provide teachers to follow. Am I to understand that the teacher designs the instruction? Ooh, now you can hear, if the teacher designs the instruction, that would be opening the line to the teacher actually doing the work, whereas Socrates wants to take it away from the teacher. Uh, Rosenthal says, in most cases, teachers use instructional programs that provide the general framework the teacher follows. So that's quite a solid uh, line. But the teacher augments and supplements the core instruction with additional instruction and practice. So although the um, instruction program provides a generally solid line, the teacher is welcome to work within that and change things according to how the teacher feels it should be done. So Socrates says, are you saying that this process of the teacher fine-tuning the program leads to effective outcomes? even if the program being fine-tuned has strong evidence of effectiveness. And Rosenthal says, yes, this process permits individualizing instruction for the specific children the teacher works with. So even though there might be a solid sequence in terms of how the program works, the teacher is welcome to change that sequence, to lay it open to different possible paths, depending on what happens with the children as the process of the sequencing of the lesson unfolds. So here you can see a debate that's starting up on the one side between Socrates, who's going to want to keep the sequencing line solid, only one option allowed. Whereas Ros Rosenthal is saying it might be good to work out firstly a good sequence, uh, but afterwards you have to open it out for the individualizing instruction for specific children at different times and different places. Now, uh, Engelman, a la Socrates, is going to find that problematic. And let me show you 
uh, why he finds that problematic. And it has to do with the process of trying to make sure that you only generate one clear inference which is right. And that takes a lot of work to do in a sequencing pattern. Now, let me just try and explain this through an example before I go on to discuss it a little bit. Socrates says, well, now, let's say that we taught the beginning reader the letters B and D at the same time. Let's say that we always presented them in the same display, B to the left, D to the right. And let's say the children became very firm on naming these letters, B, D, B, D, B, D, okay? Does that mean they know how to identify B or D in other contexts? Now, Rosenthal is a little bit surprised by this, and as the discussion develops, he says, I'm not sure I understand why they wouldn't learn the names from the presentation of B and D. There it is. They're going to learn it. B on the one side, D on the other side. And then here comes the clincher. Socrates says, because the arrangement presents two inferences. One is that one is called B because of the direction it faces. The other is that one is called B because it is to the left of the other symbol. Now you can hear what his concern is at this point. When you sequence the reading program, you have to make sure that you clearly sequence it so that only one inference is allowed and that inference is the correct one. So you can hear an account here where he's using a very uh, solid sequence but making sure that the inferences that are generated are crystal clear and work step by step by step to get the child to the end point of the reading program. Now it is entirely possible to have a, a different setup where you have an open sequence. In other words, where you allow a number of different sequences, but you still are working with very clear inferences. And I'd like to use an example of lessons I've actually seen in, in Japan, both in maths and in science. Uh, and I'll, I'll use a science example here, where what happens is they start off by presenting a really well-structured problem. The problem is very clear in terms of what it is that the problem actually is. And it's very clear on what the moves are that you need to make being either right or wrong. But what happens in the Japanese lesson is, is that they present the learners with the uh, well-structured problem. And they also present the learners with the correct answer. But the science experiment that they're working with has a number of possible ways of actually working through itself. There's a number of possible sequences. Now, any one of these possible sequences could result in the correct answer. And what the um, teacher does is then works with the children through the possible sequences. Uh, and a number of the sequences could be right, but there also are issues where there's a number of wrong steps which could be made. The thing with this uh, setup is, is that it's a very well-structured situation where it becomes very clear as the children do the experiment what is turning out right and what is turning out wrong. It's a very well-structured problem. So even, and, and here's the point. Even though you have a well-structured problem, it is still possible to have different sequences, an open sequencing line working through to the correct answer. But now... There are vast swathes of education and uh, our everyday living which don't work with these well-structured problems. In fact, uh, most of our problems are really ill-structured. You have a situation where you're not even sure what the problem actually is. It's difficult to name the problem. There's competing forces all pushing in to argue whether it's actually a problem or not in the first place. And there's competing positions on what, how you should define the problem and how you should structure the problem. And then on top of that, there's a whole bunch of competing solutions, none of which are actually uh, clearly the answer because they're in a competing uh, problem space. Now, what happens in this situation is uh, you land up 
comparing and discussing the different uh, solutions and eventually at the end of this process you land up in a situation where you come up with ideas, uh, possibilities in terms of how to address the problem and more questions. Now you can hear this is a very different zone to the one that Engelman was working with and the zone of that science problem I was working with uh, in Japan. Uh, but it's a very uh, common situation which happens both in schools and universities, ill-structured problems. So in this situation, you've also got to consider the possibility of having an open sequence or a solid sequence. Now that sounds very confusing over here. Surely if you have an ill-structured problem, then you should have an open sequence because you're going to be working through different possibility paths of what the possible answers could be. Now that's true. But what happens in the situation often is that teachers then step to giving a sequence not in terms of the concept or the problem uh, or the inferences because those are very hard to show a clear sequence line on. But they provide the sequence through how they're going to structure the process of moving through the ill-structured problem. So, for example, there's lots of research where people suggest that if you deal with the ill-structured problem, you should go through four or five stages. And the stages are very clearly defined and the teachers move through them step by step in sequence. So they start off with discussing how would you actually define the problem. And secondly, they'd go on to talking about how you would set up and work with the different solutions. And thirdly, they'd show you how you'd move into a stage where you then compare and discuss the different solutions. And number four, you then move into a situation where you look forward to ideas, possibilities and questions and you evaluate the situation. So there you can hear a situation where even though it's an ill-structured problem, which is very difficult to find the sequence in terms of its inferences or its concepts, you then provide the sequence through the stages that the lesson goes through. Now that's really bringing us into the situation of what a well-structured and an ill-structured problem is, and this deeply impacts on how sequences actually work. So let me just uh, kind of try and show you how uh, they work, simply by saying that a well-structured problem has a beginning state which is crystal clear. It's, it's well defined, right? And the steps that you move through it are also well defined. There could be a number of different paths that you take, but each path is clear and the steps within those paths are clear. And you will, in both situations, arrive at a well defined end state which is very clear. Now that's a well structured problem. And as I've pointed out to you, a well structured problem can have an open sequence, in which case you follow a number of different paths from the beginning state to the end state, or a solid sequence, in which case you only follow one sequence through from the beginning to the end. Now with an ill-structured uh, problem, it's not clear what the beginning state is, it's not clear what steps you have to take, it's not clear what your constraints are, and it's not clear what the end state is. But just because it is ill-structured like that, doesn't mean you don't have the possibility of a solid sequence where you move through stages to get from the beginning state to the end state, even though it's ill-structured. So what, what have we done uh, in the set of examples? Well, let's, let's step back from it and let's kind of put it into a, a matrix so to make sense of it. On the one side, you could have a solid uh, sequencing line, one sequence with a well-structured problem and there was Engelman working and there you can see the blue line, the dark blue line moving through one sequence all the way through to the end result not excluding all the other possible sequences that are there, completely eliminating them from the scripted program. The second possibility we have is a situation where you can have a uh, a well-structured problem but you open the sequencing line and what I've tried to do is I've tried to show it by the blue line and the green line are both possible sequences that result in the right answer uh, and it's very clear that there are other possibilities indicated in red which actually are wrong. The third possibility 
is a situation where you have an ill-structured problem, which is very uh, difficult and controversial, but you provide a solid, solid sequence, not through the inference structure and not through the conceptual structure, but by giving it specific stages where you work through the ill-structured problem in a, in a highly um, controlled and sequenced way. And finally, you could have a situation where the problem is ill-structured and you also have an open sequencing approach where you land up in a situation where you allow massive debate to occur and the situation just evolves from there uh, in, you would hope, highly productive ways.